it was just kind of a crazy idea that we had been in the industry a few years and we were just like, would this be possible? Could we actually just publish everything? Charge up your axons, ready your receptors, and shift your lobes into upper beta phase. You are listening to Smart Drug Smarts, the podcast dedicated to helping you optimize your brain with the latest breakthroughs in neuroscience, nootropics, and psychopharmacology. Hello and welcome to Smart Drug Smarts. My name is Jesse Lawler. I am your host and I am every bit as excited as usual to bring you episode number 121 of this podcast dedicated to making you smarter with everything from the newest scientific breakthroughs to time-honored wisdom to downright dirty tricks. This week, we're going to be talking about verification of supplements, which is an issue of legitimate concern to all of us, kind of ties in with food quality. Obviously, we want to know anything that's going into our body, not just what it's supposed to do, but also the what it is, if it is what it is supposed to be. You may say potato, I may say potato. Potato, but I definitely want it to be either a potato or a potato in my potato chips. Sorry not to get too Dr. Seuss on you there before we get started, but we're going to be speaking with the CEO and founder of a company called Labdoor. His name is Neil Thanadar, and we'll be talking with him in the main interview. If you hang around until the very end, I came across a story that I'm going to have a hell of a time tying this back to neuroscience. I, I don't really think I can, but it's definitely biology, and it's one of the weirdest things in biology that I've heard of recently. And I may, at the risk of blaspheming a little bit, actually be able to tie it into the Easter holiday that's going on this weekend, so we'll at least have a semi-seasonal Ruthless Listener Retention gimmick. But that'll be at the very end. For right now, let's kick things off, as usual, with This Week in Neuroscience. Smart Drug Smarts, This Week in Neuroscience. So it's hard to make blanket statements sometimes. You risk getting in trouble because, you know, not everybody agrees on everything, of course, nor should they. But one thing just about all of us can agree on is that Alzheimer's is something we do not want to get. We do not want our loved ones to get, and it's worth knowing about ways to avoid Alzheimer's. So it's worth knowing about a study that took place last year. If you haven't heard about this yet, there was a large study showing statistically significant results in increasing the likelihood of Alzheimer's from taking some common anticholinergic drugs. In particular, drugs named in the study were Benadryl, Advil, PM, Tylenol PM, Motrin PM, all of which, among other things, tend to suppress or reduce the amount of circulating acetylcholine, which is a major neurotransmitter within the brain. Now, it should be said, this wasn't like a take it one time and you're going to get Alzheimer's result, not anything close to that. The study was comparing adults that had been using anticholinergic drugs daily or close to daily for a long time period. It was a seven-year study. They looked at people that had been using one of these compounds. Some people were using them daily for as much as all seven years. And like a good study, some people weren't using any of these compounds at all. This was the largest study ever of its kind, and it followed 3,500 group health participants, average age 73, and it was conducted by the University of Washington and funded by the National Institute on Aging. The study's results showed that Alzheimer's risk may grow with higher use of these compounds, for people taking a minimum of 25 milligrams per day of an anticholinergic called diphenhydramine, this would be approximately equivalent to 1 Advil PM, Tylenol PM, Motrin PM, or Benadryl, Taking this for 3 to 12 months increased the relative risk for dementia by 19%. Extending this time to 1 to 3 years goes up to 23%, and 3 to 7 years, 54%, compared to people in the study who are not taking one of these compounds at all. So pretty big numbers, and interesting also that in only the 3 to 12 month period there, the relative increase in risk had already jumped by 19%. So while I don't think you should look at this data and say, well, I'm never going to take this stuff for a couple of nights because of Alzheimer risk, it sure would make me think twice about any sort of long-term usage. Also ominously, the study seemed to indicate that the risk didn't necessarily drop just because usage might be stopped in the future. According to Noel Campbell at the Indiana University Center for Aging Research, the risk for dementia was consistent when comparing participants with recent and past heavy use of such medications with non-users, suggesting that the adverse cognitive effects are permanent. Other studies have consistently shown similar results. The study's lead author, Shelley Gray, who's the director of the Geriatric Pharmacy Program at the University of Washington's School of Pharmacy, was herself surprised by the findings. We know that anticholinergics are related to impaired cognitive cognition acutely when people take these medicines. They feel a little groggy, less attentive, etc. But these are reversible changes. This study suggests that these medicines are also related to dementia or irreversible cognitive changes. As for which over-the-counter drugs to watch out for, basically any cold medications that might make you sleepy may contain anticholinergics, although NyQuil was cited as a safe exception here. It makes you sleepy but does not contain an anticholinergic. As for what it is about cholinergics that are making the brain more susceptible to Alzheimer's, that question has not yet been answered, says Gray. It's possible that long-term use of these medications lead to changes in the brain similar to those seen with Alzheimer's disease, such as neuritic plaques and neurofibrillary tangles. In animal models, procedures that block transmission through these kinds of pathways increase the concentration of beta amyloid, a main ingredient in the plaques found in the brains of patients with Alzheimer's disease. 
Unfortunately for all of our scientific curiosity, we're unlikely to know soon exactly what's going on to cause these changes, because it would be fairly unethical to do a gold standard cause and effect clinical trial to track the progress of this increase in susceptibility to Alzheimer's. However, as was mentioned, this was an older group, and some of the study members have already died and been autopsied, so there may be a subsample that will be available for subsequent analysis to see about structural brain changes that might have taken place says Gray. We will be examining whether those who used anticholinergics had higher plaques, tangles, and other markers of cerebrovascular disease than those who did not use these medications. Scientists are interested in doing similar tests on other classes of drugs that have been tapped by the American Geriatric Society as being associated with cognitive problems. These include benzodiazepines and histamine receptor antagonists, but neither of those classes of compounds were part of this current study. Smart Drug Smarts, the podcast so smart, we have smart in our title, twice. Checked up on the international iTunes this week and got a five-star review over in India from Shranius, who said, Have been binging on this podcast ever since I discovered it a few weeks ago. Fantastic content and great presentation as well. If you have any interest in the brain and its workings, this is the show for you. So thank you so very much to all of you near or far on the American version of iTunes or on some other iTunes platform who have left a review. That is very, very helpful. Got a lot of feedback this week. A lot of people interested in last week's episode about intermittent fasting and the cognitive benefits thereof. One small thing, this didn't make it into the show, but it actually is a pretty interesting piece of information. The 5-2 diet that Dr. Mark Matson helped come up with, where you eat normally for five days a week and then have a very calorically restricted diet on two days of the week. Those are non-contiguous days. That was one listener question. So those days do not need to be back-to-back. -back, and in fact, they weren't as part of the, uh, the foundational study there. And Dr. Matson also mentioned that some people had skewed their macronutrient ratio on those two days that they're having the reduced calories and really cut carbs pretty much completely on those days. So they're just getting fats and proteins, primarily fat as a food source, and that helped keep the level of circulating ketones in the body quite a bit higher on those days. So if some of the benefits that we're seeing here are coming from the reduction of circulating glucose and getting the body to run on fats and stored fats as a fuel source for a little while, that's one additional way of tweaking this protocol. Keeping fat heavy and carb light on those two calorically deprived days, that's a good way of promoting that process, kind of kicking it to the next level. I have not tried the 5-2 diet protocol myself. I have done the daily intermittent fasting quite a bit and have enjoyed that not just because of the health benefits, but also because it's ideal if you don't want to spend the time cooking breakfast and lunch. Even if you're a fairly crappy cook like I am, it can still be kind of time consuming even doing a, a, a bad job. And getting the vast majority of the day's work done early in the day without having to worry about making a meal or breaking to eat a meal, that can be a big benefit unto itself. We've got a newsletter over at smartdrugsmarts.com slash newsletters, a place to sign up for that. It comes out about once weekly called The Brain Breakfast, filled with further thoughts and ruminations on the kind of stuff that we've been talking about on the show, and also a great idea grist mill for future shows. A week or two ago, I mentioned in there some upcoming topics that I'd really like to have and got a ton of great feedback and listener ideas, people sending me articles to read or recommendations on who I might interview for the show. So if you ever kind of want to go behind the scenes on Smart Drug Smarts and peek behind the curtain, see how the sausage is made in the sausage factory, then definitely sign up for that at smartdrugsmarts.com slash newsletter. And if that is just too many letters for you to type, but you want to go someplace on the web, you got, let's say, 11 keystrokes. In that case, I would recommend axonlabs.io. That is the website where you can find Nexus and Mitogen, a couple of different supplement stacks that we've got with both cognitive and in Mitogen's case, also physical benefits. Mitogen is a mitochondrial enhancer, but it just so turns out that several of the compounds that are beneficial to fueling your mitochondria, which are present in every last cell in your body, are also cognitive boosting compounds unto themselves, sulbuthiamine being a key example there and one of my personal favorite compounds. Nexus is specifically brain focused. Anoracetam is at the heart of that one, along with other brain beneficial compounds like phosphatidylserine, pycnogenol, and CDP choline. We should have a choline episode actually in the near future. I feel like having lambasted the anticholinergic drugs in This Week in Neuroscience and now coincidentally mentioning the fact that we've got CDP choline in Nexus. We may be due soon for another Know Your Neurotransmitters episode. We haven't done acetylcholine yet, but that is probably long overdue. But for now, if you're footloose and fancy free on the web, do check out axonlabs.io. But now let's scoot along to the main interview. Smart Drug Smarts. So I'm about to be speaking with Neil Thanador. He is the founder and CEO of a company called Labdoor, labdoor.com. I'm not sure whether in these teenage 20-something years of the internet, we're still supposed to put .com suffixes on businesses that aren't yet household names. But Labdoor is definitely a web-based business, at least insofar as how they interact with their customers. Basically, what they're attempting to do is to plug an interesting hole in the market, something that you might think should be handled by the FDA or some branch of the federal government, but really isn't, which is close scrutiny of what's actually inside the supplements that are being sold, if what's inside the jar matches 
matches up to what's on the outside of the labeling. Labdoor is taking a really interesting approach to this and trying to provide a gateway between the curious public and an unbiased laboratory that's able to give results on what's actually in these things. They're a relatively young company and haven't tested everything under the sun yet, but they're certainly working on it and making a solid dent. And one of the kind of fun things about them is that they actually let their users decide what they're going to be testing next. So a really cool company. I like them a lot. Let's jump in with founder Neil Thanadar. I really grew up in chemical testing. So if we go back a long time ago, I like my dad's a PhD chemist. He's been doing this kind of research for 30 plus years at this point. I always loved the idea of being able to reverse engineer a product. And so that was the idea of deformulation or reverse engineering is was something that was my dad's specialty. And so I really grew up with it and wanted to do that kind of research. So I went to college at the University of Michigan, got a degree in molecular biology. And when I left school, I, the first thing I thought about was I want to be able to go and do research right away. I want to do research that impacts human health right away uh, instead of going and getting a PhD in molecular biology. So I started a lab, a research lab, a couple miles off campus called Avmean Analytical Services. And it started with just two of us. And then it's grown to closer to 40 or 50 people now at this point. That's a lot of growth. How much time did it take to go from one or two to 40 or 50? It's been about a six year process. This is year six now. So that was the first business. And that was my first entry into the industry. And I did. I really loved the science. It was so cool to reverse engineer things. We had pharmaceuticals and cosmetics and supplements, OTC medications. We even had like razor blades and sunscreens. We were doing quality control for all these different products. And the idea for Labdoor came out of that work, which was that, hey, I actually know like the inside information on hundreds of these products, but I can't tell anyone about it because, right, it's like my customer is the manufacturer. So what if there was a way where a lab operated where it was able to have the consumer as the customer instead of the manufacturer. Right. What would that business look like? How would we build a business model around it? How would we get paid? All of those things, that was the challenge. And so Labdoor just came out of that idea. And so in 2012, I uh, came up with the idea for Labdoor, partnered up with a couple people in Indianapolis, and we just started building a website that could publish this information. And it's been about four years of just publishing data on supplements. It's really interesting, actually, this isn't like a branch of the U.S. government that it needs to be provided by private industry. Does that seem weird to you, too? I think there's two things that two big jobs that Labdoor does, one which kind of seems like a government thing to do and one that is has always really been Internet thing to do. And so the thing that's always been a government thing to do is the testing itself. Right. Right. So that's kind of the unusual part. It's just like, why is there not more pre-market regulation being done in the industry? And so that's definitely the gap that we're trying to solve with our testing. And so that's one half of it. The other half of it, I think is just as important or potentially more important is once you have all this data, how do you help a consumer make a purchasing decision? And so even when the FDA does this, like you walk into a, like the pain reliever aisle, like those products are actually regulated, right? The like Tylenol versus the generic equivalent. But the FDA is just, that's just a pass fail system, right? There's no way for you to know, are you, should you be taking Tylenol or the generic equivalent, right? There's no one helping you make that purchasing decision. So for Labdoor, it has this great, kind of mixture of these two core services, one on the testing side, which is just it needs to happen. Someone needs to do it. And on this other side of like the decision making process and helping a consumer make a decision. And I think Labdoor is starting to do a really good job at both those things simultaneously. Tell us the sorts of variants that you're seeing among products that should, you know, ostensibly be the same thing chemically. What's advertised versus what actually is there in the end? So there's a big difference between different classes of supplements. And I would say single ingredient kind of synthetically made pills are the most likely to be accurate. So this is your vitamin D or melatonin or zinc, you know, anywhere from 80 to 90% of the products will pass our testing. So you see a lot of A grade products in those categories. The ones that are really complicated are one, things like fish oil and probiotics that actually can change over the course of time. Yeah. Those are the two that we see a lot of variance in because you're dealing with probiotics. We were finding yeast and mold in products especially flavored products, right? So if you've got a sugary probiotic supplement, right, that's supposed to be in a mixture. Right, the probiotics eating the sugar. Right, yeah, give it a couple months and we were finding yeast and mold in some of those products, right? And so same thing with fish oil, like you give it enough time and you're going to start seeing signs of rancidity. So that we were also looking at kind of the fish, fish oil just going bad being an issue. And so those are the types of things that are really big issues. And then we have to constantly look at things like heavy metals and green tea. We're searching for protein powders. We're looking for protein spiking. So we're finding products that have less 
less than half of the claimed protein content. So it's just all over the map, but it's purity and label accuracy are really our bread and butter. Yeah, that's fantastic. And what sort of, to keep a manufacturer honest over the long term, how often are you going back to recheck products or do you plan to recheck products that you've already checked at one point historically? So historically, we've retested certain categories every year and others every two years. The idea would be as quickly as possible to get to the yearly testing for everything. So we're actually in the process right now of getting a lab built, getting our own custom lab built. The kind of the first thing we did for the first couple of years of the business, the big focus was building a site, building an audience, proving that people actually care about this. And I think now that we're kind of going back to the core and saying, now we can actually spend a little bit of money and kind of invest in being able to constantly test. And so having our own internal laboratory facilities is going to be a big part of that. And so we're kind of already in the process of getting that set up. And so the idea is every product is tested every year. We're going to be able to do certifications as well. So if a company wants, so we're not going to charge the company to do the initial testing. We want to cover that cost ourselves to maximize the amount of products that are on the site. And then our lab's going to be able to do special certifications. So we'll be able to certify for purity. So we'll be able to do microbiological testing, chemical testing, and prove that a product is pure beyond kind of heavy metals. We can also prove that a product has no is banned substance free. So we can actually prove that a product would kind of guarantee to not make someone fail an Olympic or a professional sports league drug test. Interesting. So these are all the places that LabDoor can expand to once we have our own lab. It's just more and more testing. I think that's like the button we can always press is just more and more testing because there's products that are going to that have failed one year and passed the next. It's a pretty common occurrence. How many products are there ideally you would like to have tested? I mean, I I know that you say that like the average supermarket in the United States carries like 30,000 food products or just some insane number. So there's a few numbers that are key for us. I would say like the 2000 SKUs that GNC has is an interesting number. I've heard Amazon has 10,000 supplement SKUs as close as we can tell. They have just over 10,000. That's another key number. I would say it's somewhere in that range, somewhere between like Amazon, which tries to have almost everything and GNC, which is trying to have a more select group. And I think that's what we'll find somewhere in that range, because what is kind of happening is if you think about what GNC is, GNC is making a decision to stock those 2000 products. And for whatever reason, they decide to stock those 2000 products. Some of them are their own products. Some of them are products that they've tested or they like. Right. There's a process. But GNC, it can be a, is one filter for which products you get to buy. And I think Labda is another way to do that same filtration process. It's just a data driven way to do it. Explain to people that are listening as a consumer that wants to get the best information that they can about these things. How do they interact with Labdoor? So just go to labdoor.com. If you sign up, you get full access to all of our reports for free. So there's nothing stopping you from getting all of the data about supplements. The thing that's most popular on our site is our rankings. So for each category, protein, fish oil, probiotics, we've done 15 categories of supplements. Each category gets two rankings by quality and value. And so you can basically just go and kind of browse through each kind of aisle of the supplement aisle, but specifically ranked by quality and value. And so what we think about quality is largely active ingredient concentration plus purity and and label accuracy. And we look at value as as active ingredient concentration, price, and price per serving. I think those are just the two ways where cons- how consumers make that purchasing decision. So I think those rankings are one way where we help people make a decision. So even if the quality were not necessarily as high as far as uh, parts per million of, of what's advertised to be there, if the price was lower, then that can kind of ratchet up the overall value. Yes. And obviously there's going to be, there's some level at which quality is always going to be a factor. So, so purity is, is really the thing that's, it starts with purity, right? Like if you don't have purity, you don't move on. Right. And so those products are still going to rank poorly for value, no matter how much active ingredient they have. That's the trade off that starts happening. Once it starts getting close between two products of similar quality, then we're going to start looking at active ingredients and price per serving. Right. And I imagine if you have some things like contaminants that really shouldn't be there, that regardless of what a good price it is, it's not worth eating arsenic or something. Yeah. So the value rankings do have some purity into consideration. So it's not kind of like a straight price per serving kind of thing. Yeah. So you mentioned that you've done proteins, you've done fish oils. Now, this audience is going to be curious about the nootropic compounds and when you're getting to those. We really want to get at least one category of of nootropics later this year. Uh, So the next four that we're doing right now are also actually interesting and relevant. They are zinc, CoQ10, magnesium, and ginseng. Mm -hmm. Those are the four categories we're testing right now. We're kind of moving somewhat in that direction where we're starting to look at a lot of kind of single ingredient minerals uh, and other compounds that are just the most popular on our site. So we're generally going in the order of one category per month voted by the popularity of the audience. 
So that's, I think, a big one for us. The hardest thing, I think one of the hardest things about testing that these types of products is going to be figuring out standards for efficacy. We try to do a lot of research around efficacy and bioavailability. That's going to be a big challenge here because it's just not as much established standards. Like if you go to like for zinc, you can get like a perfect like pharmacokinetic graph of exactly how much zinc will have which kind of bioavailability in your bloodstream. It's just a lot harder to do that with a nootropic. Actually, one of the things I'd like to ask about is adaptogen compounds and things that are coming from plants and living things that are not going to necessarily have a consistent chemical formula like zinc or some purely synthetic chemical where, where like the extraction methods can really differ. Ginkgo biloba or Bacopa monary or Rhodiola rosea. So some of these things that people sort of think about under the nootropics umbrella that are plant derived, what sort of variants do you see or will you see when you start looking at these compounds derived from living things? And does that change your approach at all? We do a lot with different forms of different vitamins and minerals. So we've got some sense of this. So if you look at like even zinc or vitamin A it comes in a, a number of different forms and we have to go and look for all of them and test for all of them separately. And so that part of it is doable. The thing that actually one challenge that, that we have to figure out, and it's just part of who Labdoor is as a business is we still have to be a little bit cost conscious. I mean, we like obviously are trying to test as quickly as possible. Sometimes if there's just so many different forms and we have to test for every form, it just gets really cost prohibitive very quickly. Yeah. So that's one of the things we'll have to do is I think once we have our own internal lab, the solution to that problem is probably to start figuring out some of our own methods, right? Start doing some method development and validation on our own. And I think that's where you start really getting some of Labdoor's really powerful benefits. Like what if Labdoor is doing like small clinical trials, like IRB approved clinical trials? trials like that and kind of trying to show some efficacy. Those are the types of things where maybe the data is not available because the data is not available. And that's kind of Labdoor's job, right? Where the data is not available, we go get it. I would love to see Labdoor to actually start proving some efficacy, start looking at some ways to design clinical trials, kind of ways to design some things so that we can add more data if that's what we need. Because that's the challenge, right? It's like proving that it works. That's the hardest part of this. Like as long as you've got enough cash, you can test. It's a matter of kind of figuring out how do we demonstrate efficacy. That's interesting. And I mean, one of the things I keep thinking about is with the increasing availability of self-monitoring, wearable gadgets and all that stuff, there's a huge ability now to source data from large numbers of people with a lower cost per data point than there ever has been historically. If there's a way of making those studies rigorous by experiment design and, and you know, correctly selecting your test population, there might be some really interesting ways of getting a lot more data without necessarily having to just test and getting this population sample that's like, okay, this is going to be another sample of people between 18 and 22 that happen to be university students. Yeah, absolutely. So we have to figure that out. And so there's just not enough data. And that's, that's a big challenge. And it's a big reason why sometimes when Labdoor starts, we're still relatively new at, at four years old. And so I think a lot of what we're going to do is as much as possible, we're really going to, on a month by month basis, we're going to add a lot of the kind of standard supplements. And then we're going to have to go and do this research. And I think that's the fun part. I think the really fun part is the novel research that, that Labdoor can do and, and the data that we can find. And I want to be able to prove that some of these things work because if they don't work, then I don't think there's much of a point of testing an entire category of products. Yeah, absolutely. You, you want to talk a little bit, how do you guys make money? So Labdoor is basically a marketplace. So it's so it's a commerce dependent business model. Every product on our site has affiliate links on it as much as possible. And we basically get about a 10% commission from the retailer whenever we sell a product. And so that's the core of the business. So that's where the revenue comes from. And I think it, it serves a couple of cool purposes. So one, it actually is an interesting feedback loop to us. When we say that one of our big important jobs is helping a consumer make a purchasing decision, the great thing about our business model is we get paid only when we help someone make a purchasing decision. So it really aligns our incentives well. And I think the other thing that is really valuable is when we first tried to make Labdoor, we, we racked our brains trying to figure out, okay, so we want to test 10,000 supplements and each supplement costs about $1,000 to test. So we need $10 million a year in a budget. Like that was our dream when we first started the business. Like how are we going to get $10 million? And so the first idea was like, oh, well, let's go get like a million people to pay 10 bucks a year. And that's actually surprisingly hard to do. And I think that's that kind of data membership is just such a hard business these days. The internet kind of makes that subscription model so difficult. And I think what we're going to have to say is like, look, we're going to have to get five or 10 million people coming through a site. We're going to get a dollar or two per affiliate. And that's how we're going to pay for it. And so I think it's a really cool system. The other thing that I think makes it really cool is that to me, kind of logically, this makes the, the perfect sense of how the business should actually be run, how like a marketplace should actually exist. 
the people who sell you the products should be testing the products, right? It just makes sense for it. It makes sense that that 10% of the purchase price goes to making sure that the product is tested and safe. I guess the only tweak that I would make, and maybe you're doing this already, it seems like the perfect system, you should have the same affiliate commission for all products. Like if, if you're making 10% from one product, you shouldn't be making five from another and 15 for a third to like keep you completely neutral. So it's basically like that. What ends up happening is the large majority of our affiliate goes to Amazon who gives us the same percentage for every product. So really, like if you look at it, it's like we basically are getting the exact same percentage for every product. We don't really pay attention to it much, but I think that's the for us, I think it's a great system and we're going to get paid no matter which product you buy and about the same percentage no matter which product you buy. We have a great way to basically say you're not going to pay a cent more for lab or service. And so you get to use it for free. You get to decide whether you actually want to listen to us or not. You can dig into the data on your own. And if you like it, definitely throw a couple buck tip our way using the affiliate links. Clever. And I, th I think the way that you're approaching the decisions on, on what you want to test next and just letting the consumers drive that, hey, we're interested in this is very smart. Thank you. I think we've been all over the place. We've tried all different models. We've just been f pushing and fighting to make Labdoor grow because I think that's what we have to find is we've got to find a way to make this testing sustainable. And I think Labdoor is really close to being able to prove that. And so we just have to constantly just fight for perfection. At some level, Labdoor is a really intense place to be. Like it's an intense place to work because you've got these scientific debates going on at, at lunch and like people are always <laughs> working on every little data point, right? And so that's just part of who we are. And so for Labdoor to be successful, we've just got to keep testing, keep testing new things, keep adding new data to the site. I mean, this is a many year process and we're, we're going to get as much information to consumers as possible. Have you had like any interesting sort of war stories over the time that you've been doing it, like supplement manufacturers that you've outed for having misadvertised what they're selling that have been shaking their fist at you or trying to say, hey, you know, this data is not real. Like anything interesting that happened along the way that would be a good anecdote? Yeah. So it, there's a couple of times actually that through like no effect of our own, we actually have been like basically like witnesses in class action lawsuits. <laughs> so a couple companies have been sued recently for protein spiking and the lawyers on the plaintiff side will just cite Labdoor, basically using us as, as one of their information sources. Yeah. And what that actually does, it's a pain for us. It actually, like, we end up getting subpoenaed. We have to go, like, make a box of documents and send it to some lawyer. So we've done that a few times. Like, we've just been served with subpoenas for a case that's not even directly related to us. Yeah. And we just put a big box of all of our files together, put all the products in a box, and ship it over there. And so, a bit of a pain, but I think there's a lot of that. I'm hoping that people read the court case and, and know that it was us, but for the most part, it's just part of our service. Like Labrador is kind of this interesting business in the sense that it operates almost like it's like a regulatory agency in some ways, right? So like right. we have this work that we have to do that's not necessarily like benefiting us in a business way. It's not like we're not making any revenue off it, but it's just like work that we have to do because it's who we are. Yeah. Uh, and so it's a, it's a unique business. Never really been a part of something like this before. And it kind of just, it just naturally evolved from this idea that we just need to get consumers this data and get them help on their purchasing decisions. And everything that Labdoor has become and everything that it's going to be is just like driven by that. You know, obviously you and I are talking in America, but we've got a lot of listeners in other parts of the English speaking world. Are there equivalent businesses or is, are regulatory agencies within the government handling this in places like the UK or Australia, maybe? So there's different regulations in different countries. Canada has a mandatory registration system, so they're still not testing, but the products are being registered. India is looking at potentially really diving in and, and testing supplements. Brazil has a testing program. So different countries have started to do some of this work. Other than that, I think a lot of what other countries do is they often look to the U.S., an odd thing because in a lot of industries you expect to look at the U.S. and that they'll actually be setting a quality standard. And it's weird that in this case, people still look to the U.S. Like if you look at a lot of Chinese supplement purchasers, a lot of them will go and try to buy American supplements. And it's, to us, we think of American supplements as having poor quality. But to other countries, that's actually preferable to issues with authenticity, right? With counterfeit products. There's all these other issues. Yeah, we're, we're the best of the worst. Right. And so there's so many places where I think if we improve U.S. standards and we keep doing our testing, we get traffic from every country in the world. So we will happily figure out ways to test more American products and truly Im improve the quality of American products so that when people look at Labdoor's marketplace, anyone in the world can buy from it. So that's the dream. Smart Drug Smarts. 
So thank you so very much to Neil Thanadar for taking the time for that conversation. I think the company was name dropped enough times in that interview, but just in case, that is Labdoor.com, where they can be found on the web. And I think they're just a great example of the sort of thing that the internet makes possible. In this case, a really consumer-driven testing apparatus. So check them out. They don't have every supplement category under the sun just yet, but they're moving in that direction and a really good resource well worth looking into. But now, let's switch gears, if we may, to the Ruthless Listener Retention Gimmick. Smart Drug Smarts. Ruthless Listener Retention Gimmick. Okay, so I I was thinking I might try to tie this Ruthless Listener Retention Gimmick into the fact that this is Easter weekend. But but I've thought twice about that. I I can't. It would be the biggest stretch of an analogy that I've done. And and I've stretched some analogies pretty far before. I was thinking there might be a way of tying this into Jesus and the virgin birth. But that's really more of a Christmas time thing anyway. But but this is kind of a virgin birth Ruthless Listener Retention Gimmick. Now, if, if you're a big science fan, you probably might think that virgin births are something that really only take place in hermaphroditic species. And if you're a human, it's a pretty fair bet there's going to be some coitus involved at some point in the process. If you're a Christian, you're obviously a believer in at least one virgin birth, but probably not think about it as a matter of course. It's kind of the exception that makes the rule. But get ready to be shocked. There was a baby born in Hong Kong last year who was born pregnant. I'm not kidding. She was born pregnant, pregnant with twins, no less. This condition is called fetus in fetu, and it is very, very, very rare, occurring only once in about every half of a million births. Scientists don't know why this happens. Says Dr. Drayan Birch, an obstetrician and gynecologist in Pittsburgh, weird things happen early, early in pregnancy that we just don't understand. This is one of those medical mysteries. The World Health Organization considers a tiny fetus found within an infant to be a kind of teratoma, which is a type of tumor rather than a normally developing fetus. But the doctors who treated this particular baby girl from Hong Kong wrote that rather than a teratoma, the two tiny fetuses inside of her might have been the remains of sibling twins that were absorbed into her tissues during the pregnancy. Needless to say, it was not going to be medically possible to allow this newborn baby to go to term with her two fetuses. Although there was no moral grappling that took place about whether to uh, perform what amounted to be an abortion, they didn't know until they actually went in to perform the surgery to remove an unusual mass that these two little fetuses were what they were going to find. These were apparently between her liver and her kidney. According to Birch, fetus in fetu might be a surprisingly common phenomenon. So one in every half a million births, I mean, that sounds like, well, that almost never happens. But then I started to think about it. How many births actually take place on planet Earth in a given year? And the best numbers that I could come up with are that currently there's about 350,000 babies born every day. That means about once every day and a half, this actually happens. Some baby is born pregnant with other babies. And unsurprisingly, these fetuses do not survive. In this baby girl's case, each of the babies had had an umbilical cord and a placenta-like mass in the girl's belly, but according to Dr. Birch, they still need a placental flow and other stuff that wouldn't have been present in order to actually grow and survive. What would probably happen in the lieu of surgery is most likely they would have died and been reabsorbed partially or wholly by the body, although in some cases such things are not fully reabsorbed. In 2011, an 18-year-old boy had his retained twin, as it was called, removed in a major surgery. So very, very strange things that the body is capable of. I, I could not help but think of Russian dolls when I first first heard about this, about a woman pregnant with a baby that in turn was pregnant with babies of its own. Just say no to drug... Ah, scratch that. Say yes to the Smart Drug Smarts podcast. Join our mailing list at www.smartdrugsmarts.com. Okay, you heard it. That is the entire episode number 121. Thank you for hanging around until the very end. If you enjoyed this episode, please tell a couple of friends about Smart Drug Smarts. Sign up for that mailing list if you have not at smartdrugsmarts.com slash newsletter. Or if you got three minutes to kill and you're just not sure what to do with it, then it is always helpful to leave us a positive review on iTunes. That helps more folks find the show and is super appreciated by yours truly, among others. Last week, if you didn't catch it, we spoke with Dr. Mark Matson about intermittent fasting and the cognitive benefits thereof. If you missed that, you can find that at smartdrugsmarts.com slash 120. And for that matter, this week's episode is smartdrugsmarts.com slash 121. Next week, we I, I know I've been promising you a couple of episodes that we haven't actually delivered on yet. Cannabidiol. Not to be confused with cannabidiol, which is how I was previously pronouncing it, but I learned the error of my ways. We've got an episode on that coming, but it's probably still a couple of weeks away. Thanks to the fact that late April actually has a marijuana-related holiday that it seemed appropriate to time that episode up with, since cannabidiol is a marijuana plant extract. Thanks for the pronunciation and marijuana culture tips to a listener who prefers to be referred to mysteriously as the land of 420. As for next week's episode, 
episode, I'm going to keep you guessing. There's a couple of challengers for that interview spot, and we're still duking it out in the offices here trying to figure out exactly who it's going to be. But it will be worth tuning in, so definitely do so. That'll be next Friday, same time, same podcast, with an unflagging, unshakable, and 99.999% pure commitment to helping you fine-tune the performance of your own brain. Have a great week, and stay smart. You've been listening to the Smart Drug Smarts podcast. Visit us online at www.smartdrugsmarts.com and subscribe to our mailing list to keep your neurons buzzing with the latest in brain optimization. Smart Drug Smarts should be listened to for entertainment purposes only. Although some guests on the show are medical doctors, most are not. And the host is just some random guy. Nothing you hear on this podcast or read at smartdrugsmarts.com should be considered medical advice. Consult your doctor and use some damn common sense before doing anything you think might have a lasting impact on your brain.